Matthew 25, beloved, is a chapter which consists entirely of three parables. All of them concern eschatology, the doctrine of the last things, and most especially the Lord's return for judgment. They're a call to us to watch, to be ready. There is another chapter in the Gospel accounts which consists of three parables on the same theme. You may know the answer. Luke chapter 15, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, also called the parable of the prodigal son. So Matthew 25, three eschatological parables, Luke 15, the lost things which are found. Matthew 25, though, is not the greatest chapter in Matthew for parables. Matthew 25 has three of them, but Matthew 13 has seven of them. It is indeed also the foundational chapter of parables because it contains the mother of all parables, the most basic parable, that is the parable of the sower with the four types of soil, or you could say two types of soil, one good and one bad, and the bad is three types. We should also note, though, regarding Matthew 25, that it is part of our Lord's Olivet Discourse. Olivet from Mount of Olives. You see, in Matthew 24 and 25, Jesus is with his disciples on the Mount of Olives, which is outside the walls of Jerusalem, on the east standing or sitting, looking west on the walls of Jerusalem and the glorious temple. The disciples ask him, What is the sign of thy coming, Lord, and of the end of the world? Then in Matthew 24, Jesus deals with what we now call A.D. 70, the fall of Jerusalem to the Roman armies. This is a type and picture of the days leading up to our Lord's return at the last day. In AD 70 and the second coming run right through the chapter. Some bits are sort of equally both. Some bits are more AD 70 and other bits are entirely the end of the world. We know there from that chapter of the various signs, the signs of the times, there shall be wars and rumors of wars, persecution, <coughs> apostasy, signs in the church, signs in the world, signs in creation. <coughs> the positive sign is that the preaching of the gospel must go out to all nations, and then shall the end come. And after Matthew 24, we have, of course, Matthew 25, in which Jesus reinforces his teaching on the last times with three parables. Jesus is coming back, therefore watch the parable of the ten virgins. Jesus is coming back, therefore labor diligently the parable of the talents. Jesus is coming back, and that means the great judgment day of the sheep and the goats being separated on the left and the other on the right. Now it's these three parables, the three parables in Matthew 25, Christ's last three parables, which we're going to consider in turn in the final three sermons of this series on the parables of Christ last week. Very simply then, let's turn to the ten virgins. First, the background. Second, the parable. And third, the calling. Ten virgins. The background, the parable, and the calling. 
Now this parable this evening is another one which deals with a wedding. Last week we had the king's wedding feast, the invitation going out, the summons, the call, people being bidden, and so forth. This week we have the, the ten virgins. Matthew 22 last week, now Matthew 25. The difficulty for us with this parable here, at the start of Matthew 25, is that the wedding customs in first century Judea are different from those in the UK in the 21st century. This parable speaks of tarrying, verse 5. But here it is the bridegroom who tarries, not the bride. That strikes us as strange. Because the nearest thing we have to this is that sometimes, perhaps more so in former days, the bride keeps the groom waiting for a while before the wedding service. But that's not the idea here. So what is the background for the wedding arrangements of the parable? I need to say, first of all, a couple of things, provisos. The first is that scholars differ somewhat in their opinion as to the details of these wedding festivities. They differ somewhat as to the details, which also means, and you could put it positively, they agree in the main. The second proviso is that the customs may have varied a little from city to city, within first century Palestine. But those two provisos really aren't that serious, though it's worth mentioning them to you. It goes something like this then. This was the typical procedure. On the wedding of, on the morning of the wedding day, the bridegroom would leave his house. He would leave his house and go to some secluded place for festivities with his friends. The bridegroom leaves his house, he's away. Then, later, the bride would go to the house of her husband, the house he has vacated. And there she's going to prepare herself for the evening <coughs> celebration. So he's away from his house with his friends, and she is with her friends in his house. Then, as the sun begins to set, so after basically a day apart, the bridegroom and his companions head off towards his home. <coughs> and the way is lit with flaming torches or lamps carried by his companions. There were no street lamps in those days as we know them. And then as the bridegroom's group <coughs> neared his house, they would be spotted by the bride's party. The cry would go up, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And then the bride would make the last minute preparations and she would head out with her maidens to meet the bridegroom somewhere outside his house. And her maidens would also be carrying lamps. The two parties then would meet somewhere outside the house, that is the bridegroom with his companions carrying their lamps, and the bride with her maidens carrying their lamps, and then together the two groups would return to the house, and then would be the greatest joy and festivities. That's the basic framework in which we're to understand this parable according to the experts, and they're pretty much agreed, so we can safely rest in that. <coughs>